the global coronavirus outbreak has wreaked havoc on the travel industry. And if you're a cruise company, it's been absolute chaos. Cruise lines have been hit hard, as you know. Bookings and earnings estimates are dropping right along with the stocks. It was a little, it was, had to be expected. Princess Cruises have suspended cruises for 60 days. Shares of Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian Cruise Lines are all down more than 70% in 2020 alone. Ships from fleets across the world have become sites of COVID-19 spread, infecting hundreds of passengers and killing others. The pandemic has basically shut down the cruising business, with the three largest publicly traded cruise companies suspending some, if not all, of their operations. Every member of the Cruise Lines International Association, the body representing the global cruise industry, has agreed to suspend operations from U.S. ports of call. Now, ships already at sea are floating without a port to accept them. I've only ever seen them close cruise ports for hurricanes or earthquakes, and I've seen a lot in the industry. I've been through SARS, Ebola, swine flu, bird flu. I've seen it all, and I've never seen anything like this in the history of the travel business in my 41 years. But time after time, cruise companies have proven resilient, despite seemingly insurmountable setbacks. Neurovirus, measles, Legionnaire's disease, E. coli, collisions and capsizes, passengers falling overboard. Cruise companies have seen it all, and they've still mostly bounced back after every major crisis. In fact, before the coronavirus pandemic brought the industry to a standstill, 2020 was poised to be a record-breaking year for the cruise business. The industry was expecting to carry more than 32 million passengers, almost twice as many as in 2009. And they're getting younger travelers on board, with 71% of millennials having a more positive attitude about cruising compared to 2017. The one thing they like is they can see a lot of destinations without having to pack and unpack. So being able to take a cruise to go to all those different ports, it's fine dining is what you typically get in all the restaurants. Um, all your entertainment is included. You figure about 80% of your trip is prepaid. So you get your room, your board, and your entertainment included. But some experts say that this crisis is different. For one thing, the government has effectively, temporarily, canceled an entire industry. The State Department has advised that no American should step foot on a cruise ship. The top U.S. coronavirus official also not mincing words during an interview on NBC's Meet the Press. Say no large crowds, no long trips, and above all, don't get on a cruise ship. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which typically just posts health notices for destinations, not forms of transport, came out to warn travelers against all cruise travel worldwide. Well, I mean, in, in over 30 years, it's uh, it's unprecedented. Uh, we've never seen, uh, you know, the, these types of warnings uh, really ever. Unlike past neurovirus outbreaks, passengers have been forced to quarantine on an unprecedented scale, either aboard the ships or at U.S. military bases after disembarking. Cruise companies are rapidly hemorrhaging money, and so far, the U.S. government has made it clear that it won't be lending a hand to help bail them out. The question now, will the global cruise business bounce back like it's done countless times before, or is this the end of cruising as we know it? Carnival has been at the heart of the cruise industry's struggle against the COVID-19 outbreak. The Diamond Princess, a vessel operated by Carnival Corp's Princess Cruises, now lives in infamy as one of the first major outbreaks of COVID-19. Yeah, so, so one of the big mistakes that they made was that they kept people on the ship, that they basically made it into this larger Petri dish, let people intermingle, let them share spaces, let them uh, interact not only with each other, but with the crew as well, who weren't trained in infection control procedures. And so it really got out of hand pretty quickly. And I think it probably would have been better if they had immediately evacuated everyone from the ship and got them somewhere else where they could have been, been quarantined. Tyler and Rachel Torres were on that ship. They spent 27 days in quarantine. 24 hours after they tested us um, via throat swab, um, we found out that we were going to be quarantined on the boat for 14 days um, due to 10 positive cases of novel coronavirus. Um, they, they didn't tell us who was positive either. Right. They just kind of took you off like the Hunger Games. Right. Ultimately, more than 700 passengers and crew on that ship tested positive for the virus, and at least eight people died. In March 2020, two more Carnival-owned ships, the Grand Princess and Holland America Zandam, became sites of coronavirus outbreak. Carnival's struggles have rippled into the wider industry. Ports around the world have denied entry to cruise vessels, and travelers have canceled trips en masse. 
Carnival did not respond to CNBC's request for comment, but in an interview with Axios that aired on HBO, the company's CEO tried to make the case that it isn't any riskier being on board a cruise ship than on land. And so all I'm suggesting is that a cruise ship is not a riskier environment. People perceive it that way, but the reality is it's not. This directly contradicts the CDC's guidance that cruise passengers are at increased risk of person-to-person -person spread of infectious diseases, including COVID-19. With the government also warning Americans against traveling by cruise ship, the largest cruise companies in the world were effectively forced to shut down operations in March 2020, as the threat of a crackdown by authorities loomed. While the cases of COVID-19 on cruise lines comprise a small percentage of the overall global pandemic, cruise companies are in an especially precarious position. Cruise ships are particularly susceptible to outbreak because it's very easy for things to spread on a ship. Just about any type of gastrointestinal or respiratory pathogen, in theory, could be um, spread on these cruise ships. Yeah, you're, you're living in close quarters with individuals, you're sharing lots of things, you're sharing common dining areas, um, common recreation areas, going to you know the casinos or the dance floors or things like that, or the, the lounging by the pool and sharing uh, deck chairs, sharing towels. I mean, all of these things are, are can be potentially um, vehicles for sharing these pathogens. So it's just a lot of that really intense exposure over you know a week or 10 days or so that you're on this cruise. And then of course, you're often going from port to port as well. So you have the potential to pick up any pathogens that are circulating in the towns that you stop in and bring them back on the cruise ship as well. So it's really just a perfect scenario to acquire and spread these organisms. Unlike past outbreaks, industry experts think that COVID-19 will fundamentally alter the cruising model. You know, the worst case scenario that, frankly, we didn't even envision. Well, I, I don't think, frankly, we're going to get back to normalcy. Um, frankly, it could take years. You know, even under the best case scenario where the, there's containment of this virus, it could literally take up to a year for things to uh, get back to any semblance of, of normalcy. Shares of the three largest publicly traded cruise line companies, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian, have collapsed. In 2020 alone, Carnival stock has plummeted 74%, Caribbean 78%, and Norwegian close to 82% as of March 31st, putting the valuations of the big three at multi-year lows. Goldman Sachs analyst Stephen Grambling thinks Royal and Norwegian will end up outperforming Carnival, given that nearly half of Carnival's cruise brands have been battered in the press over its struggles with COVID-19, while its two chief rivals have had limited exposure. But Carnival is no stranger to calamity, and when its stock price has taken a hit, it's shown it can recover. Over the years, it's faced every disaster you can think of. Fires, stranded vessels, colliding ships, pipe bursts, and mass flooding. But perhaps its two biggest scars are the sinking of the Costa Concordia off the Italian coast, killing 32, and the infamous Carnival Triumph, which gripped global media. My entire room flooded, so after... From what? The toilet, the shower, everything. My feet were, I mean, the floor was squishy. However, Carnival wasn't defeated. It sunk hundreds of millions of dollars into upgrading its systems across the fleet, and it gave the Carnival Triumph its own $200 million makeover, plus a new name. Of all these debacles, the only serious outsized move you see in the stock price, at least initially, is from the Costa Concordia, and it came back strong after that. That said, as of late, things haven't been looking quite as good for Carnival stock. It's been steadily declining since 2018, and it began 2020 at a lower share price than in 2016. Credit rating agency S&P downgraded Carnival on March 13, 2020, and says it's continuing to monitor the big three for downgrades. Despite the onslaught of bad news, Carnival still dominates the market. It's the world's largest cruise operator, accounting for nearly 50% of all cruise passengers in 2018, the most recent year this data was made available by trade publication Cruise Market Watch. And up until its brush with COVID-19, its fundamentals were solid. Sales for Carnival had been strong, rising every year since 2015, and more than 10% from fiscal year 2018 to 2019. That's nearly double the revenue of Royal Caribbean and more than three times Norwegian sales in fiscal year 2019. Its net profit also dwarfs the competition, though it's been struggling to maintain growth. But Carnival remains nimble, especially in the face of crisis. As the cruise industry shuts down, Carnival was quick to free up its access to cash to tide it over. 
On top of the $518 million it already had on hand, Carnival tapped its entire $3 billion credit facility. It also said on March 31st that it's raising $6 billion in stock and debt. An important move when you don't know how many months you have to survive with little to no income. Its long-term viability, also promising when you consider Carnival's debt-to-equity ratio. It's a measure used to help evaluate a company's risk. The higher the ratio, the greater the risk, because it signifies the company has been fueling its growth through borrowing. Carnival's debt-to-equity ratio is 45.3%, which is considered a good balance between what it owes and what it owns. Compare that to its two chief rivals, Norwegian and Royal Caribbean are around 100%. Both took on a lot of debt at a time when debt was cheap, which may prove difficult to pay back during a rough patch like this. But Carnival also has its own payments coming due, plus the $4.8 billion it's committed to spending on new ships in 2020. The COVID-19 outbreak has laid waste to entire sectors of the global economy, but none faster than the cruise industry. But the $45.6 billion business is making the case that if it goes down, it could bring the wider economy with it. In a statement to share the news that the industry would be voluntarily suspending travel, the Cruise Lines International Association made it clear just how critical a role it plays in the U.S. economy. Quote, the cruise industry is a vital artery for the U.S. economy, supporting over 421,000 American jobs, with every 30 cruisers supporting one U.S. job, and annually contributes nearly $53 billion to the U.S. economy. Cruise activity supports travel agencies, airlines, hotels, and a broad supply chain of industries that stretches across the United States. The organization is also rolling out new industry-wide protocols to ensure public health on board. So, Without going into the details of our plan, from a public health perspective, we have already put into effect a lot of screening protocols in terms of people's ability to get on board. If they've been in one of the prohibited countries in the last 14 days, they can't come on board a cruise ship. So we are going to elevate our screening protocols. Then once the guests are on board, we are going to elevate the way in which we care for them vis-a-vis -vis the realities of uh, COVID-19. And um, as soon as we can test in volume, and I know you were just addressing that a few minutes ago, uh, we will incorporate testing into our daily and weekly care for our guests. And then should there be any kind of event involving a sus suspected or confirmed case, we are going to be very prepared as an industry and in a self-sufficient way to handle the transportation and logistics and care for all the guests and crew who are on that particular ship. Though CEOs from the top cruise companies met with Vice President Pence in Florida on March 7, 2020, to talk through the dire state of the cruise business, the industry's trade group told CNBC its lobbying efforts had been targeted toward helping its travel agent members, rather than the cruise operators themselves. Now, whether they were asking for the cash or not, it was a big blow when the government effectively excluded the cruise industry from its $2 trillion bailout. To qualify, it would have needed to A, have been created or organized in the United States or under the laws of the U.S., and B, have significant operations in and a majority of its employees based in the U.S. The biggest names in the cruise business don't meet the criteria. For example, though its headquarters is in Miami and its shares trade on the New York Stock Exchange, Carnival is actually incorporated in Panama. Royal Caribbean and Norwegian Cruise Lines are incorporated in Liberia and Bermuda, respectively. This has enabled some cruise companies to pay little to no federal taxes to the U.S. government. Cruise lines also tend to hire foreign workers who don't always fall under the protection of American minimum wage requirements. Carnival and Royal Caribbean did not respond to CNBC's request for comment. Norwegian opted not to give an interview. But in a securities filing from March 2020, Carnival said, quote, We cannot predict when any of our ships will begin to sail again and ports will reopen to our ships. Moreover, even once travel advisories and restrictions are lifted, demand for cruises may remain weak for a significant length of time, and we cannot predict if and when each brand will return to pre-outbreak demand or fair pricing. Some have likened the current plight of the cruise industry to that of the airlines, when the government shut down airports following the September 11th terrorist attacks in the U.S. Travel demand tanked, and several major American carriers declared bankruptcy, despite the support of federal aid. And this is like the cruise lines 911, especially with all the bad publicity that has taken place with, you know, large ships where you got 2,500 passengers on board or 4,000 passengers and seven, 700 sick. I mean, it is created, you know, it, it's no different when they took those airplanes 
and crashed them into the World Trade Center. People watched that over and over and over. That's all you saw in the news. Everybody was afraid to travel. To stave off a similar outcome, cruise line companies are trying to book out their post-pandemic travel seasons, slashing ticket prices in order to draw back customers. They're also trying to rehabilitate their image. Carnival has offered its vessels as floating hospitals in an effort to mitigate the strain on facilities already pushed past their capacity on shore. Another boost to the cruising brand, billionaire Richard Branson is getting his skin in the game. Branson is launching the first ship in his carbon neutral Virgin Voyages fleet in August 2020, with a mission to attract millennial passengers. Think young professionals happy to pay a premium for a luxury, family-free environment. But it also, um, now we've got, you know, people from all the various different Virgin companies we can pull together when we launch a new venture like this. We can get a big, big blank sheet of paper out um, and we can fill in that paper and we can work out all, all the things we don't like about other people's cruise ships um, and all the things that we feel we should do on our, on our cruise ship. And, um, and I think, you know, the, I mean, the, the wonderful thing is you know, it's all very well doing on a bit of paper, but the proof of the pudding is in is in the ship itself. This kind of move could inspire confidence across the industry. Another possibility for the cruise business, go smaller. I have seen a lot of advertisements come across my computer lately for um, from different tour companies and read a few stories that they're trying to promote small cruise travel. Viking Cruises, for one, is coming out with Viking River Cruises in the United States. They're gonna be going down the Mississippi River in a smaller ship. So I think this may bring back small cruising again, because people actually, they love cruising. But even still, analysts watching from the sidelines remain bearish on the industry's ability to recover. I think if you look at sort of the whole tourism segment, um, I think that this is going to be a painful for all of them, but airlines will likely recover. People will get back on planes. I think that hotels will also recover, but I think cruises may actually have a hard time Investors we spoke to remain worried about getting into cruise stocks, not just because of all the losses right now, but because there's a feeling that people won't want to cruise again. However, the global head of Cruise Lines International Association remains confident that the industry will bounce back. We're a resilient travel sector. We're a resilient bunch of people. There are a lot of leaders in our industry who have been in, in the segment for decades. We've been through other remarkable and unprecedented and unforeseen challenges. We'll get through this one too.